Welcome to the Holy Land and this biblical site of En Gedi. Here some interesting things took place. The main thing that we're going to be focusing here is on this was a hideout of David. So when David was fleeing from King Saul, this was one of his favorite places. You can hear the water in the background. It's this amazing gorge, this wadi where there's this uh, natural spring and the water just flows out of it abundantly. It's also a picture of living water in the desert that Christ will refer to and that God will refer to over and over again in Scripture. So at this biblical site, we'll be looking at the location of this place and why that's so important. We'll talk about the historical background of this location. We'll be looking at some of the amazing places of interest at this site. We'll see the key events in the Bible that took place here and we'll end with a faith lesson in order to learn the major lessons God desires from us at this important biblical site. So I think you'll find this video very enlightening and transforming to your life. A little bit about its location. It's located on the west side of the lower part of the Dead Sea, about 11 miles north of Masada. And we're gonna be going to Masada next. And it's this beautiful oasis fed by a large spring in a barren, dry place. So you're not gonna get a greater contrast. You're gonna go from a barren wasteland desert to this beautiful oasis of living water. And that will be a picture that God wants to paint for us of what He is like in our lives. He is a fresh living water spring that gives us life in a dry and barren wilderness that we live in, which represents the world. So just a little bit about the historical background of this area. It has had inhabitants for millenniums. In fact, En Gedi was inhabited by the Canaanites uh, long before Abraham and Lot arrived here and the Israelites came. And scripture says that this Dead Sea Basin was once like a garden of the Lord. And we know that there were five main cities around this Dead Sea that God destroyed when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So in times past, this area was like a watered garden. It says in Genesis 13, 10. And when Abraham and Lot decided to part because their livestock was great, Abraham was a gentleman and he conceded and let uh, Lot choose what uh, place he wanted to take, what part of the promised land he wanted to take, although they hadn't had a full acquisition of it yet. That would come under uh, the Israelites, under Joshua. But it says in Genesis 13, 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zor. And we'll be going towards Zor here after we're done. And after we're done with Masada, that's where we'll be headed. So it was like a well-watered garden of the Lord. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. So Abraham was more up in the Negev area, up above us to the west. That's where we're headed today as well, to Beersheba. And Lot chose this well-watered area of this valley, this Dead Sea Valley. But once again, it appears like it, Scripture says it was like a garden of the Lord. That's why there were hundreds of thousands of inhabitants in this Dead Sea area that God destroyed when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He mentioned that, that he destroyed four cities specifically. The other one isn't mentioned, but there's five known cities. And we're gonna be going next to what's believed to be Gomorrah, and they are these cities that are now ashes, but uh, research has found these sulfur balls that are there that are found like no other place in the world. So there was a lot of inhabitants down here, and Lot chose this area. And then later they moved into Sodom. And I think that was because of his wife. She wanted the bright lights of Sodom. Now, due to the abundant water supply, the village by the En Gedi Park has had a long habitation of people from the past till now. So once again, the Canaanites were here. Then Lot chose to live in this area. It was well watered. And then uh, later David would come here. And uh, we'll be looking at that here in a moment. So now let's look at what God says about En Gedi and where it's mentioned in Scripture. Now, En Gedi 
was used in a love poem in the book of the Song of Solomon. Okay, Song of Solomon is a book of romantic love, a husband and wife relationships, and it says in uh, Song of Solomon 114, my beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of En Gedi. So it's mentioned in Song of Solomon. And then in the millennial reign of Christ on this earth, God speaks of how he will change the Dead Sea region once again to be like a garden due to a supernatural river that will flow from Jerusalem. So it says when Christ comes back in Zechariah 14 that he will descend on the Mount of Olives with power and great glory and we as believers will descend with him, the armies of heaven, the angels will descend with power and great glory. Christ will just light up the universe as the lightning comes from the east to the west, so shall the appearing of the Son of Man be. It says the sun will be darkened, the moon won't give its light, the stars will fall, the, the heavenly bodies will shake, and Christ will come back in power and great glory, we with him. And when he does that, it says the Mount of Olives will split in two, and it will move from north to south. And it says it's going to come this massive spring, and half of it is going to be a river that runs towards the Mediterranean, down towards Joppa, and half will be a river that runs down to the Dead Sea area, down towards Jericho and then down to this area. And that massive water is going to bring this health and cleansing and life to this area. Follow along with me as I read this. This is in Ezekiel 47, 9. And it says, and wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be many fish, for the water goes there, that the waters of the sea, referring to the Dead Sea, may become fresh so that everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea from En Gedi to En Aglaim, which is south of here. It will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. So what you're seeing the Dead Sea right now will be transformed during the millennial reign of Christ. And it's gonna become fresh water and there's gonna be fishing all along here. And it will return back to it appears how it was earlier in history. God's just gonna supernaturally transform this whole area. Now, En Gedi was also one of David's main hideouts when Saul was pursuing his life. It says in 1 Samuel 23, So Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, that place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. Now, where do you think might be this rock of escape? It's believed that is Masada. Masada also means fortress. It's a natural force, and we're going to be going there next. So it appears David went from this rock of escape, which we believe is Masada, and he came here to En Gedi. And he would spend time here in En Gedi because, once again, it's this living water in the desert. So, En Gedi paints a perfect picture for us of living water in the desert. And so now the Israelites were a desert people whose whole history was related to the desert. Think about the Israelites. They went to Egypt, they wandered in, in the desert for 40 years. A good portion of Israel is a desert, so they're desert people. So if you could classify the kind of people the Israelites were, they were desert people. And so when they came here, they would fully appreciate, and when they saw living water, they would fully appreciate what it meant. So once again, living water played a key role in the lives of the Israelites. It was their life without living water. You don't drink out of stale or stagnant water because it's dangerous. So you would drink out of living water. Now in Jeremiah 2, God is going to use this imagery of living water contrasted with water in cisterns to speak to us of how many times we trade living water for dead water. And that's what the Israelites had done as well. And that's what many people on earth, many people do, is they really don't want the living water. For some reason, they're content with stale dead water. Here it says in Jeremiah 2, 12, Be appalled, O heavens, at this be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. Why? For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns 
that can hold no water. So instead of living water, God's people had chosen to reject the living water and had chosen to hewn out cisterns for themselves and drink out of dead water. And that's a picture of what we do. We think that our plans and our dreams and our goals and life without Christ is going to be fun and great, but it's dead and it's lifeless. And we fail to realize that the living water is in Christ. It's found in God through Christ. God used desert imagery to show how those who abandon him are like a parched desert without water. It says in Jeremiah 17, 5, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. That's talking about this area here, okay? Blessed is the man or the person who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by a stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought for it does not cease to bear fruit. So we see that Christ refers to himself as living water, that God rebukes his people because they had traded living water for stale, dead water, had chosen their own way instead of the living water in God. And then we see that those who do that are like a parched plant in the desert instead of trees by living water. So when we forsake the Lord and we turn away from the Lord and we don't include the Lord in our lives, then we become like those drinking out of dead stale water. We become sick and we become like parched plants without water. So interestingly, Christ is always using imagery from the Old Testament to refer to himself. So Christ just doesn't come on and just speak of new things, although he does a lot, but he's always helping the Jews understand that he's fulfilling these prophecies. So it says in John 7, 37, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And when the Jews heard that, they know exactly what he's talking about. He's going right back to imagery that they would know that in the same way God was living water, in the same way that God provided water for the Israelites in the desert, when Moses uh, struck the rock and out came living water, they're gonna know right away that Christ is referring to himself as God, as the one who led them out of Egypt, uh, fed them, supplied their needs in the desert, and that he is living water, and he's also fulfilling the prophecies of like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and etc. So, what are some faith lessons that we can learn from this place and the imagery of living water? Well, living water in the Bible refers to spiritual life and vitality found only in being right with the Lord. So when we're right with the Lord, we are connected to him and then we can partake of this living water. And this living water feeds our souls, feeds our lives. It is our life. If we turn away from the Lord, then the only other option is to hew out cisterns for ourselves. That's when we go our own way and do what we want to do, and that's dead water. And we will not only become sick in this life, but then we will be sick for eternity, which refers to hell. So the only logical option is living water. Now stagnant water is full of sickness and diseases and refers to the person who lives life without being right with God. And I'm using the term without being right with God because sometimes even we as believers can live sometimes like practical atheists. We uh, just go about our lives and sometimes we're not walking with the Lord and we're going our own way and then we become sick spiritually as well. Now, Christ 
is the source of living water. So if we are believers, we need to be right with the Lord to partake of this living water. If we're not believers, then we need to receive Christ so that we can begin to drink of this living water. And receiving Christ, the living water, is where life is at. And maybe you're watching by video, and we would invite you to receive Christ if you haven't. That's where the life is at. It's not in us and our plans, it's in Christ. And then also, do we fellowship regularly with God in order to receive this living water? So just because the living water's there, doesn't necessarily mean we're drinking of it. In order to drink of the living water, we need to read God's Word, we need to be in prayer, we need to walk with Him moment by moment. And that's how we will receive the living water. And this living water nourishes our hearts and our souls. And then as we close, once again, the Israelites sought to find life in hewing their own cisterns, which represents following their own plans, their own desires, their own heart, their own will instead of turning aside from that and following the Lord. So the question for us is, are we hewing out cisterns for ourselves, hewing out our own plans, our own desires, our own dreams, or are we yielding ourselves to Christ and drinking of His water? So once again, I just want to read this verse once again that Jeremiah says, be appalled, and this is God speaking. Be appalled, O heavens. Be astonished, O heavens. It's like, can, can this be? At this, be shocked. <laughs> be utterly desolate. It's like all of the creation, it's just like creation is just in this state of shock. Be astounded, be appalled. How can it be, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. And we have the tendency to do the same. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. That's the first evil. They have forsaken the Lord. And the second is they've hewed out or carved out, made cisterns. What's cisterns? That's where you hold water, but it's not living. It's dead, stagnant water that you don't use for drinking unless you're really desperate. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. So we can hew out these cisterns that look like they can hold water and maybe we can drink some out of them, but they don't hold water. They're cracked and then it's empty. So we find nothing. What we think would bring life instead brings emptiness, disillusionment, and pain. When we build our hopes and dreams around our will and plans, we are in essence drinking dead, stale water that will make us sick. If we truly want life, purpose, joy, and fulfillment, then we need to drink from the living water, which is Christ. By drinking the living water, we will have lives that will be all we hope for, and we will be storing up riches in heaven that we will enjoy forever. We'll close this video by moving up to the highest location of En Gedi, where an amazing and beautiful waterfall exists. It's the perfect picture of living water in the desert. This is a beautiful place here at En Gedi. It's a very popular place, and you can see people here uh, getting wet, uh, rejoicing in the water. It's a hot day, it's a desert day, so people from all over Jerusalem and all over Israel come to this area in the same way David and his uh, men came here to be refreshed and cooled in the living waters. So the people here today are coming to be refreshed uh, in the living waters. Hopefully, they, along with us and you, would be refreshed by the living water of Jesus Christ living in you, His Word richly dwelling in you, and you choosing the living water, and me choosing the living water, instead of cisterns with stagnant and oftentimes deadly water. So hopefully you've enjoyed this uh, beautiful scenery here, this beautiful uh, waterfall. You've enjoyed the other uh, places in Engedi here. So it's a beautiful, uh, refreshing place in a desert with living water. So thank you for watching and God bless you.